Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a fucking. Ain't a fucking. Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I'm, I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. Are we going to straighten out? No, we had a problem. I mean, uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Nice. Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, you ever notice that I always wait until Philly does at least one four before we start this show? That's because we are all about respect for our fellow drummers, especially gods like him. Not according to some of the email we get. Oh, anyway. You knew that somebody was going to say, why are you talking over Philly, man? Well, um... We probably, I mean, I can say if I were talking over Philly, I'd just be to keep from hearing how good he is and getting depressed. <laughs> well, we're going to have a little bit of uh, throwback talk towards Philly at the end of the show. Hint, hint, tease, tease. We're going to do a little segment at the end on one of our on underappreciated drummers. It's not Philly, but it's kind of a throwback to Philly. You know? Yes, sir. Yeah, definitely influenced. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening to the show. We want to throw out big thanks to everyone, especially, again, over at the guys at Drum Forum. You guys are giving us encouragement to go on. And let me tell you, I need it after my drive over here to see you today, John. Atlanta. And a couple close calls on the way over. We're just happy to be. It's going to be a cheerful show today because we're just happy to be alive. That's the truth. Yeah. Well, speaking of our listeners, thanks again, guys, for... Uh, tuning in and we appreciate all your comments we're getting all kinds of good stuff of which we're actually going to address uh, a little bit of listener questions and email um, on the show today which again we appreciate you guys can contact us through the normal channels our email account is drummers weekly groovecast at gmail.com you can also check us out at facebook on our facebook page at uh, facebook dot com forward slash drummers weekly groovecast and on twitter which is again it is it's starting to pile up we're getting followers john it's at dw groovecast and then but on the the frowny face side of things i'm going to use some emoticons on this show okay. we we need to get more people over to our youtube page yeah i i was thinking about that earlier and i haven't partaken in that yet and i need to so um I'm going to jump on there and post some stuff and maybe you can follow suit and everyone come and join us. Uh, we'll, we'll try to, to make the content exciting and, and, uh, make it worth your while. Yeah. And, and then, you know, what we'll also do is as naturally the show is, is being posted on YouTube, but we're also going to put content on there, whether it be videos, uh, regarding some of the different music that we discuss on the show. We're going to post that on there, but we're also going to put some exclusive content on there as well. We'll try to alert you uh, about that stuff through our Twitter page and, and Facebook uh, timeline and feed as well. So we'll try to keep everybody up to date, you know, so you'll know that, hey, some new stuff's posted on there. Go check it out. I like it. Yeah. So anyway, guys, today's topic is we promised a long time ago that we were going to appeal to what we call the pure drummer, the gearhead, the knob twister, the tweaker. Today, today's the day. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about swivel nuts and all kinds of good stuff on today's show. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about tuning today. We had somebody allude to that. Um, on a, I can't remember how it came to us, John. It was either on the Facebook page or an email. Somebody said something about what are your thoughts on tuning? How do you approach it and whatnot? And, and one thing that's definitely different um, 
about that on our instrument as opposed to say guitar or piano is that we don't have a standard tuning right it's very subjective certainly far from an exact science and the ever popular subject of opinions factors into in that we all kind of have our preference as far as tuning and approach and what's right or wrong and I, I, I think that right or wrong is really kind of just a little off base in that what are you going for or what is your engineer going for or you know that that should really be the focus and uh you know someone might not take the same approach as you do but the end result is uh is uh by all means the um most important thing and i think that uh if you uh have been doing it long enough you know and through trial and error that there are a number of different approaches and uh you know I, I just encourage anyone who's maybe new to tuning or just stuck in a rut which i have certainly come up against in my years of doing this that um you know ask some other people check it out you know listen to listen to some different people's opinions on it and approaches on it and some cool things could come of that well and the way we're going to address it john is very much in that matter in other words we're gonna we're gonna talk about this kind of from the ground up and there's going to be a lot of leeway for interpretation mm -hmm. on some of these things but we're going to address it from the get-go as far as like if you're starting from scratch and, and what i mean by that is we're going to assume that the heads are off the drums we're going to go through getting the drum prepared all the way up to head choices putting them on and tuning them up for a variety of different styles uh for a variety of different styles of drums themselves including sizes and you know just the characteristics of even some some drums like to be tuned different ways and you know we'll, we'll kind of address that a little bit as well mm -hmm. but to your point uh, again, this is a very subjective thing, and we're just going to give you kind of our take on how we approach these different things. So you can, you know, use it for what you like or jettison it if need be. Yes. And don't be distracted by, you know, Phil maybe having a little more excitement about this subject than I do in, in, in our delivery. I, I will be honest with you. I'm not the most passionate individual when it comes to tuning and uh, we could get into why, but I'm not going to do that. And ironically, his kits sound like a million bucks. Oh, occasionally. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, we're going to start this thing from the ground up. And, and John, what I thought we would start with is just let's talk about what it looks like when we're getting ready to put some new drum heads on. And basically, I wrote down, we got to have a few tools, got to have a few things close by mm -hmm. to get started. And the list that I have, or what I should say, what I have near me when I'm getting ready to do this, is, of course, you got to have some drum keys nearby. Some folks like to use the the speed key. There's a whole different, there's a bunch of different varieties of those that you can use. And those are especially really good for getting drum heads off. All right. right. And then some guys, I know you in particular, John, especially when you're doing a bunch of drums, you like to, I think you use a drill with a key bit. I sure do. Right. Yeah. And then I also like to have some sort of tension rod lubricant. Some people like Vaseline. That works great. Some people like the white lithium grease. The one thing I will tell you on this, don't make the old rookie mistake. Don't get black grease. Mm -mm. You're going to be in for a world of hurt. That's nasty business. Yeah, that's not good stuff. Uh, I also like to have for cleanup, a few paper towels or cloth laying around there. You're going to need that. You're going to need it to rub down your bearing edges if you have any stuff stuck to them. And of course, just to get the requisite lithium grease slash Vaseline off your hands. Um, if I'm working on an older drum, especially if I've got something where the bearing edge is a little bit rough, I'll even 
have a little, I've got a little round tube of beeswax. Mm -hmm. You can put that on the bearing edge if you need it. Don't really need it for newer drums, in my opinion. Although some of the hardcore old school guys will say you got to do it got regardless. Got to do it, right? You got to. And, of course, you got to have some drumsticks. Got to tap around on those drums. Certainly helps. Yeah. And then if you're going to do any uh, muffling, whether it be like for a bass drum or for Tom Tom's or snare drum, you can use the muffling of your choice, whether it be like little pieces of moon gel. Some folks will use pieces of old drum head. Mm -hmm. That works pretty good. Gaff tape is a tried and true old uh, deal with like uh, the, what is it, the Jeff Beccaro? Yeah folded gaff tape routine i i don't know that we should ever do a podcast without mentioning gaff tape as the uh, you know that's the mvp of virtually every gig in one way or another isn't it i'm a true believer in it for a million reasons the gaff tape company's a true believer in it anyway go buy a large roll and run you like 50 bucks these days you know yeah they, they definitely hammer you yeah and then lastly you gotta have some drum heads and boy there's a whole variety of those you can go through, huh? There is. Um, one thing that I would encourage you to do is, uh, that I've run into problems with is on two ply heads, I'm an adamant checker of heads when I buy them. As a matter of fact, I rarely buy two ply heads online because I'm so hardcore about um, making sure they're what I want and um, a lot of that came from for a long period of time I did a ton of teching and a ton of rentals like studio rentals and two ply heads were a real pain in my butt because I would go you know maybe I'd buy four heads for a four tom kit or something for a session and two of them would just be dead and I just couldn't do anything about them. And I figured out that oftentimes there's air between the plies and it just will, if you hold the head up and hit it, it's just dead as a cardboard box. So I figured out with two ply heads, my experience in my opinion is the ones that sound really papery when you tap them typically don't have that air lock in there and they tend to open up and give you tone and give you sustain and uh and all of that and so that's one thing to not shoot yourself in the foot early on is you know more so with two ply heads is just make sure that it's a good serviceable head it's not you know you're not fighting it from the word go i'm just going to stop this show right here that that's good man i there's nothing i'm going to say that's going to be any better than that oh. i just learned something yeah, that's that's a that was I've had some expensive lessons regarding that, and normally um, that real dead sounding head is that's just that that you know in that process inevitably there's going to be some air that gets between plies, and that's the end result of that mistake. So be a little more uh, selective when it comes to two ply heads. I know a lot of guys like them. On certain kits, I love them. So uh, you're not battling that. That's something to think about. Well, that's that is sage advice right there that I'm taking to heart. So right. let's go ahead and jump into some individual drums. Oh, you know oh, what? Okay, Before um, I, I I forgot in tools. Oh yeah. I'm a uh, and it I'm a hard core user of something that some people just hate, and that's the drum dial. And it kind of was born more out of uh, one situation was I was living somewhere where I couldn't make a lot of noise for a while. And so I'd want to get things in the ballpark before I'd get to a sound check so I could just tweak. And and mind you, I, I don't think that a, a drum dial is a be all and end all. I think it gets you in the ballpark, especially when you're talking about multiple heads on a kit, you know, in one sitting. It gets things kind of in the ballpark and all that. So I, I like to use that. Some people talk about that tune bot, which I'm not familiar with. But um, I used to tech 
some kits at a big church where there was multi campuses and multi stages. And I think it was seven kits at one point. And uh, anything I could do, you know, the drill, the um, drum dial, getting things kind of, mm -hmm. you know, where you're not just running blind and and that th th those are, those are some things that i that have helped me a lot and you know some of these old school guys are like blah, 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 you wouldn't use that i'm like you know what man you use a computer to help you find out information mm -hmm. you know you use tools every day that make your life easier in my opinion that makes my life easier so i encourage you to check out things like that because it can get you uh, it can save you some time and some frustration. Wow. Uh, well, there's there's two things I'm going to have to work on there. Because, I mean, because I've always just done it. And like I said, we're putting the cart a little bit in front of the horse here because we're going to address this a little bit more. But, man, I've always just done it literally by feel, mm -hmm. you know, that, that sort well, of that, thing. I can really feel it, you know, as far as like when I'm getting to where I need to be. But that sounds like that, that eliminates a little bit of that uh, it guesswork. Does. Like I said, it's not it's not the... Yeah, you know, it's not just the magic solution, but it oftentimes gets things. Um, now, granted, your drums got to be pretty together with that. Mm. Like you can't have an out of round or slightly a bearing edge slightly off on it because your readings are going to be funny. But I, I'd I'd like to think my drums are all in pretty stellar shape, and if they haven't, I have a couple techs that'll go over that and make sure that they are so i'm starting with a you know a tool or a, a drum that is going to allow, allow that tool to be effective and i know in right. your case just about everything you own that's not going to be a, an issue either because it's, you know stunningly good drums and high quality drums are allow to you allow you to use that tool effectively so duly noted so um, now that we've kind of covered the things that you're going to need, all right, let's go ahead and jump into some actual tuning processes and preferences. Okay. And we're going to start from the ground up. We'll start with uh, bass drum. And a couple of things that you, you know, that the listener is going to need to know right off the bat is, well, what kind of heads are you using, especially for the resonant side? Because the two obvious choices is you're going to have one that's either going to be ported and what we mean by that is one that's going to have a hole in it that allows for miking. And the other way is a non-ported head. Mm -hmm. And so basically, my dividing line on that is if I'm playing my rock and pop gigs that need to be miked, I absolutely use a ported head. It doesn't necessarily affect the resonance so much simply from the standpoint that I'm muffling that drum fairly significantly anyway. Yeah, that's yeah. that. That's not something that oftentimes is overlooked in, in that Absolute. argument. Yeah, uh huh. as opposed to when I'm playing a straight ahead thing and I'm using an 18-inch bass drum, it's always got a full resonant head on the front. And the majority of the muffling that's done there is one of two ways, is either through a felt strip which I will use from time to time. And sometimes another thing I actually kind of like even better than that is I will use a uh, small towel, roll it up, and a lot of times put it not against the resonant head, but actually put it against the batter head. You put it like between the, the pedal frame and the head? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah you that can, works great. Yeah, and then and see, and then the thing is also, not to get too far off subject here, but a lot of times if I'm either in a session or live and somebody wants to mic the bass drum in uh, for like a the little 18 inch open bass drum, I actually have them mic it on the batter side. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and not the resonant side, mm -hmm. you know, so I have them do that. So now the tuning aspect of it, because that's what, what we're talking about here. For that resonant side, my take on the ported head is this. I normally have that head tuned low not honestly not much past the wrinkle stage on there to get just a nice low fundamental mm -hmm. on that and um for the actual full drum head resonant side uh, like if i'm going to play the 18 inch bass drum that's wide open 
I use a little bit more of a tom tom approach from that standpoint and will tune that resonant head sometimes a little higher okay. than the batter head on that. And it gives me a couple things. Naturally, it will allow a little more resonance and will also give you somewhat of a tad bit of a pitch bend uh, on that, which can be uh, which can be uh, a nice thing for that sort of for that sort of kit and for that sort of setup. So that's kind of my approach to the resonant side. For the batter side on both of those, um, for the larger bass drum that is muffled for the rock and pop type thing, I kind of like, I'm, I'm a big fan of the power stroke yep. style, single ply power stroke style wow. drum head. And again, tuned pretty loosely, man. I mean, loosely enough from the standpoint that it seems like a lot of times, especially if my drums are traveling somewhere, if they're on a truck, it seems like always a tension rod or two will jingle jangle a bit, yeah, you, gotta, you know, they get loosened up. Yep. And yep. so... I, it's it's again not much past a wrinkle and again you have to keep in mind that when we're talking about this guys this is a this is a muffled bass drum we're talking about primarily getting you do get resonance but you're primarily getting attack mm -hmm. you're getting impact sound for this yeah, yeah that that's um that's something that gets lost i think sometimes in conversation like i've noticed on forums a lot of times that the guys that are saying i never port and i never muffle uh, you know if you look a little deeper into it they're not gigging a lot and if they are they're not you know they don't have a cranky sound man who knows what he's doing micing up their kit and all that. Good so point. you know as, as a working player i think we by default end up especially with the bigger drum and the more the you know groove sound and muffled sound and all that you just make things a lot easier for everybody including yourself to go ported have the pillow of your liking in there or whatever it is and make things you know a lot easier now interesting enough on the the tuning side of things with a bass drum i completely go by feel on that uh-huh i never no drum dial no none of that okay. it's always just just past the point of wrinkle and and then just kind of feel and hear and how it how it just feels in my gut you know when i'm playing it yeah that it just kind of falls into place as you tweak a little here and there front i'm a little more insecure about the front head tuning but it normally just kind of it just kind of finds its place totally a feel thing versus more the scientific scientific slash tool approach that i might do with tom or snare so yeah and go figure you know another thing i don't know how you feel about these john but i can appreciate the retro and vintage kind of thing of using the t-rod style tension rods but i actually prefer just the regular drum key kind of tension rods always yeah I, I, on even on my vintage kits a lot of times you I'll, replace them yeah. yeah because i just and you know to be honest with you, I, I probably re replace T rods more because they become a pain in the butt when you're trying to put it in your bag. Well, I've, I've, <laughs> and I, I'm I'm just annoyed by that at the end of the night. So I've got uh, you know a couple of Gretsch kits that are vintage that have the T rods, and and just quite honestly, they sometimes get bent. Yeah, that's really common with those. Too. Yeah. You know, so that's a drag. You know, when you have that happen as well, Look, no doubt. looks looks a little bit weird. I, I probably have. 25 bent Gretsch T rods sitting in some box in my garage. You know, they just, I don't know what it is about those in particular, but they, they tend to want to bend easy. I smell an eBay auction. Oh man. I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Buy my junk. Yeah. And, uh, and then quickly about the batter head for the small drum. My, my approach to that is again, a single ply head. I can go either way like I earlier mentioned about felt strip on there and or uh, a towel, you know, up, up against the batter head. One thing I think that sometimes gets lost a little bit with the felt strip, I, I think a lot of people don't really know how to install that very much anymore. The biggest thing I can tell everybody when you're putting a felt strip on is when you lay that thing across your, your bearing edge, depend, you can 
lay it vertically or horizontally depending on you know how you feel about it is once you then put the drum head on there and then you put the you start putting the tension rods and the hoop back on there and tightening it up what you have to do to to make that thing effective is you then have to pull uh that felt strip to where it lines up flush against the head mm -hmm. or it doesn't work i've seen i've seen some drum sets before that guys will put it on and it's real loose well, and it's not even it's it's not touching it up against the head so you do have to pull that thing to get it to seat up against your, your batter head when you do that so just keep that in mind if you want to experiment with that now one thing john have you ever seen this before there's there's a i think it's aquarian that makes this drum head that has a felt strip already attached it's on it. to it i love that works good man yeah. i also have um i figured out back to the glorious subject of gaff tape um i will take that felt strip and put it on and heavily gaff tape it on the shell because gaff tape doesn't you know it's not like duct tape where it's leaving residue and all that right but i'll i'll put the felt strip on tape one side to the shell pull it taut tape the other side put the head on and it typically is flush too if you know like sometimes like the pull thing is like i don't know this is mine's just a lazy man's approach to getting that taught ultimately but another option you can do if you're not you know comfortable pulling it or if it keeps pulling out or whatever you mm -hmm. can always tape it on yeah. each end but just make sure it's really taut right and then after i get all that stuff together then tune it up i will actually get I'll get that bass drum from my preference. I'll get that batter head tuned up fairly tight. Mm -hmm. uh, again, trying to get from that standpoint a little bit more of a tom tom sort of vibe, because even if I'm feathering the bass drum on that, there will be there will of course be resonance, but there will be enough attack, so to speak, on that feathering quarter note bass drum pattern that I'm playing that will it will certainly give enough bottom end low end to the band and reinforce the bass line enough. And it's a, it'll be a good mix of some resonance and of course, natural attack for the mm -hmm. bass drum beater. Yeah, I always kind of view in, in that traditional bebop tuning vibe, I, I don't really think of the bass drum as a bass drum like I would if I'm like the, the you know, the foundation of a kit and that fat groove. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just like a fourth voice, you know? Yeah. That's all. It's like a another low, it's like a lower tom you, you're playing with your foot. But that's kind of how I've always thought of it when I'm tuning for that in that, uh, you know, I know I know a couple guys that will use a, an 18-inch bass drum on like a hybrid groove kind of gig where they're doing maybe some jazz stuff early and some, and they'll use like a, E mad or something like that. Oh, it's amazing! It's got low end. And all. Well, if you're approaching it that way, sure. But in in more of the traditional acoustic jazz sense, I think get out of it. Maybe get out of the mindset of it being a bass drum as we think of a bass drum, and and tune. It's just another voice, and and get tone, and get you know think along those lines. And cool. That's a, it's a an interesting and cool way to come about. Yeah, that I, vibe you're talking about. Right. And, and I'll tell you, my mindset is I still do approach, even when I'm playing that style of music, I still approach it, so to speak, from the ground up. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, I still, I, I will use it from the standpoint of, of a bass drum to where it does reinforce the low end. But yeah, I do absolutely also have the mindset of like, this is an active voice on the drum set that is more than just we'll call it timekeeping. It's an active voice that improvises inside of the timekeeping. Right. And therefore having that little bit of tone and that voice and that sound along along with the impact sound, it does, it integrates within the rest of the toms, cymbals and snare drum as an active improvising timekeeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else you want to add on bass drum there, John, before we move on? Um, no, I, 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 think, I think that covers it pretty well. Well, let's go ahead and move on to toms now, because we've alluded a little bit about that before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing in particular that that I want to cover, and I want you to definitely, because you, you've got a great handle on this, is uh, let's talk about the different hoops 
that are available by different manufacturers mm -hmm. that go on Tom Toms. And primarily what I'm talking about is triple flanged hoops, which you find readily on virtually every, every manufacturer will use triple flanged hoops from time to time versus there are a couple companies that, that use die cast hoops. Mm -hmm. And, and then just to, 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 to kind of describe for, for folks that are not familiar with those die cast hoops are the heavier all cast one piece piece of metal hoops that are like i said they're heavier they they have a tendency to dry the drum out a little bit primarily use the one i always like to 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 talk about is gretch mm -hmm. they always use die cast hoops top and bottom as opposed to triple flanged hoops which are i think some people call them spun hoops uh they're lighter they tend to open up a drum a little bit more but john Tell us how you feel about both of those and kind of the properties that uh, that they that they sound how they sound to you and how you approach. Well, certainly on on toms, um, you have uh, in the, the triple flange hoops the you know a, an o more open sound for sure, and I think uh, depending on the shell makeup, it can dictate what heads you're using more so my experience is like on a gretsch kit i just you could use any head on a gretsch tom Do, it's going to sound different obviously right but it's going to work though because the 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 die cast is kind of the great equalizer rigid yeah yeah and, and just sort mm -hmm. of you know so it, it's just you know the property of the head design and 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 material is going to dictate more of that but a, a triple flange hoop you know you have a lot more openness so you're talking about um you know certain like an all maple drum with a triple flange hoop you're getting a, that's a live drum man you know mm -hmm. so in that lower tuning you know um sometimes a single flange or single ply head you might it might just be a little overbearing it might be just too much going on too much overtones all that you know, maybe you go with a two ply and all that. Definitely more open. Definitely more room for overtones. Room for just uh, a, a lot more sonically happening mm -hmm. versus a, a, the diecast being a little more focused and drier. And it's not right or wrong. It's all that. But um, from my experience, I think you have to be a little more mindful of head choices. Like I know, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a vintage ludwig three-ply drum you know chances are a pinstripe's just not really going to be a great choice to bring about all that is beautiful about that drum and this is just my opinion but you know it just kind of begs for maybe a single ply coated head and and it, and it's just the, the the nature of the way the shell's made the reinforcement hoops triple flange hoops all of that Again, you know, there's, it's just dictating a little more what head it wants, and uh, and then, like I said, you can get into more like the Gretsch thing, and I mean, it's wide open. And I've tried every head on a Gretsch drum, and they and all they work. They all mm -hmm. work, you know, whether you like it or not. Yeah. One particular head versus another is another story, but it, it's amazing how um, triple flange can be a little more finicky in that sense. You know, and one thing I think it's kind of interesting regarding die cast hoops is that I've had it happen before where I've had a drum tuned up and you play a gig and you don't even notice it till the end of the gig. One of the tension rods is nearly backed completely yeah. out and the rigidity of that die cast hoop will hold that drum in tune really well. So true. You know, that's kind of along the, the same line. We've had, we've laughed about some people poo poo on Gretsch's five lug. 10 and 12 inch hoops and it's sort of just like it almost doesn't matter because of mm -hmm. what you just said like the, the the uniform tension in the circumference of the drum stays relatively close as long as the other four tension rods are engaged and at the tension so it's kind of like a you know oh yeah it doesn't really affect tuning a whole lot you know it's just you're still ultimately taking 
five points on the head and trying to get it in tune with itself yeah. versus six. So that argument always was kind of like, eh, maybe you, you have an agenda against Gretsch versus you have an agenda against five lug hoops. Right. You know, what's the truth here? Because die cast hoops are, are far more forgiving in that sense. So with that in mind, John, when you are prepping for a pop rock gig, what's your basic tuning tenets for toms? Um, I normally will go, um, I kind of have come back to clear heads in that setting. Mm -hmm. I, I just, you know, I mean, I'm a product of the eighties in a lot of ways and that sound and that feel, um, and I just, they just, they just tend to work a lot, but I, I'll, I'll normally go with a clear single ply on the bottom, clear two ply on the top, you know, coated two ply is cool mm -hmm. too. Um, but generally I, I try to get it tuned down about as low as i can get it to go without without it just completely flattening out and you know losing all all of that or or creating weird overtones right way of it. what is your relationship uh bottom head tightness to top man i'm i'm a, i'm kind of a pretty even tension guy yeah like the pitch bend thing i just I, I kind of feel like it's more dumb luck than it is hmm. in exact science. And I, I, I get the theory behind it, but I, I, maybe I just don't have the patience to, to, to mess with it. So I kind of just, I, I just sort of like, oh, just let me get it in tune with itself. Right. And then, you know, then do some muffling. So that's kind of my thing. And I know there's guys that really like that pitch bend thing and have got it pretty locked in. I, I just personally tend to be like, man, I want to get it in the tomb of itself, have it fat and resonant and not running from itself. You know, one, one thing that I like to think in a little bit of a concept in my tuning with, with toms like that is that I do like a very slight pitch bend, not, not one of the severe style pitch bends where you have the boom, not, not one of those, right. But, I think that by the nature of using a single ply head or a thinner head for the resonant side and then a thicker head, even if, for example, if you've got a clear single ply head for resonant and if you've even got a single coated head for the batter, mm -hmm. even though they're both single, single ply heads, the top head by the nature of the coating is going to be a little thicker and a tad bit darker that even if you do have both of those heads tuned relatively close, that bottom head is still gonna be just a tad bit higher pitch simply from the standpoint of it being a thinner head, Agreed. right? Yeah, so uh, that's true. So kind of my, my approach to it is I get the heads fairly close with indeed the bottom head a slightly bit tighter okay. with a little bit of higher pitch. And I always like to think, especially with my Tom Toms, I think in terms of I tune the bottom head first especially for like a pleasing pitch, mm -hmm. right? I try to, if I'm tapping around on the drum, try not to hear any like strident overtones or strident pitches that come immediately out, you know? Something that's got a, 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 a pleasant tone. And then I will tune the top head primarily that it feels good. Mm -hmm. and, that, and of course, that it's tensioned properly, right? So I do the old trick of, and I know most drum heads are made it is significantly better than they were 25 or 30 years ago. But, but even as I put the drum heads on, I do put my, my thumb or, or hand down in the middle of try to stretch them out a little bit oh, yeah. as they go on. Right. And then as I tune it up again, get it tuned to where it feels good. And then naturally the top head will affect the pitch as well. Not quite as much as the bottom head, but then I will then fine tune that top head mm -hmm. to get it, to a proper pitch and to where it works in sympathy with the bottom head. And I will use as far as that, the head combination, bottom head is virtually always single ply clear. Top head, I will go between clear, double ply, and then sometimes traditional single coat, single ply coated heads. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing, John, the majority of the time when I'm tuning for like pop or rock, the concept and the way that I tune it will be identical. In other words, whether it's a double ply or a single ply, it's just that I know the single ply will give me overall slightly higher pitch overall and a little bit more resonance 
you know, and not using any muffling, so to speak. Right. You know, and then whenever I'm doing like a straight ahead thing, like if I want to tune them up high, like the, we're going back to like the little bebop kit, I tune them up high, man. I mean, I, I get them up there. Make them scream. Yeah. Yeah. Where, and the primary reason for that is, is, you know, as well as I do that if you're going to end up playing brushes, if that, if any of your drums are tuned down really low, they're not even going to speak. No. Whenever you, you're going to get no articulation and no resonance at all. So, and again, we're talking in generalities here. So in other words, me tuning them up high to somebody may not be high enough, you know, so to speak. So, you know, we're, again, we're talking in generalities here. Bottom head, once again, clear, single ply, tuned up high. I heard somebody on a, uh, or saw somebody on a, uh, a forum say, it's tight enough to where it's screaming for its lawyer. Yeah. So, I've seen, I've you know, I heard that, that before. And then top head for the straight ahead stuff will always be single ply coated. Again, for brushes, mm -hmm. if, if you need to on that. And again, tuned up high, not as high as the bottom head again, but they'll be tuned up high enough to where there's not a pitch bend. Right then in that case and and you could even say that for the larger drums that i do that with on the bebop stuff also is that they're tuned up significantly higher than one would expect on a pop or rock kind of a gig and again they're tuned up high enough like say a 14 inch floor tom where i'm using again clear single ply on the bottom coated single ply on top to where you hit it there's not going to be enough resonance to get a pitch bin, a pure pitch bin, so to speak. Yeah. Well, it, well the whole idea of, of that, you know, it's funny, like, when I think about playing straight ahead, I, I don't want really resonant toms. Yeah. Because you're, you're doing far more mm -hmm. intricate and, you know, notier, notier things where all that, re you know, it's not a big power ballad here we're talking about. Right, and it's the kind of thing also that by the nature of what we're playing in that style, if we're playing in a pure acoustic setting with acoustic bass, acoustic piano, horns, that kind of thing, you don't need that much resonance to fulfill or fill out a sound that's being overpowered by electric instruments. Right. So the articulation that you get you know, from those drums, are it's going to be very important. And again, if it's, if it's too boomy, if it's too loud, you're going to lose some of that articulation and especially so the lighter that you play again you it's very difficult to play straight ahead stuff and feel really good about it on really big deep open you know yeah. floppy like flappy when drum we do heads. a dinner set at a wedding and you're playing on your big groove kit heresy john it's awful heresy hey yeah what i'll tell you what man my next gig, if you want to bring a little bebop kit for my dinner set, I'll play it. What do I get out of it? Your buddy not Bucket full committing of heresy <laughs> to your sacred jazz yeah. music. <laughs> You'll hear my bad brush playing clearly because they speak. <laughs> I don't know. I, that's yeah. all I got. Hey, um, real quick on the Tom thing. Uh, given time, like if I know, you know, I got a day or two, maybe a, it's a session or I'm just going to change heads before the weekend. Mm -hmm. And like that, I will, with without a doubt, um, put new heads on and really crank them up and let them sit. Oh, yeah. Let them seat, you know, seat mm -hmm. the heads that way as opposed to this. Like I, I'll, I'll crank them like bebop tuning. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, mm -hmm. then back them down and start from scratch there. So, you know, given the time, I, I like to do that. I, I think the great Simon Phillips does that, too. I oh, love yeah. that guy, by the way. Anytime I can work him into a podcast, I'm going to. He's got a man crush on that guy. I man. do. I like that guy, man. He's good. It's, it's his big bass drums, no doubt. <laughs> I thought it was his curly locks. That could be. Yeah. Or that he's short and you think I could take him. I know I could take him. I met him at a NAMM show way back, like, it was a summer show in Chicago. That's how yeah. long ago this was. So think about it. <laughs> we took a wagon train to the to the the convention. I was going to say that was so far back, man. I'll have to calculate that on an abacus, right? To Maybe, yeah. That uh, but he, uh, I, I I had no idea, 
and he walks up and he's like four foot eight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, I think the look on my face was probably pretty telling and embarrassing. But he plays a whole pile of drums, though, man. Big ones too. Yeah, it's so bizarre. But he's a, he's a little guy, man, and and sounds like he's larger than life. So he is, man. It's pretty Love awesome guy. stuff. You know, one last thing before we move on to, to snare drums, something I was just thinking about also, I, I might be the only guy that, that, that does this, but I always, always when I'm replacing heads, and it doesn't matter if I'm tuning for five times or if I'm tuning for two, I always start tuning with the largest toms first and go yeah, back up. Yeah, that, that tends to work well for me too. Yeah, it, it's just, I think most everybody that, after you've done it for a little while, kind of realizes that getting the larger drums in tune is it's a little bit of a challenge. You got to find their happy place first, and then you can most of the time make those smaller drums fit where you need them to. You're 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 absolutely right. Yeah, let's talk about snare drums now. Oh, the ever popular. You know, I I don't have nearly as uh, as strong opinions on this as a lot of people do i'm kind of like i'm kind of i'm the snare drum equivalent of your bass drum yeah tuning just, and maybe it's just because i don't know what i'm doing i don't know man um it, i've never heard a snare drum of yours that doesn't sound like you don't know what you're doing well i appreciate the confidence my approach on snare drums is again um i really crank out the heads first back them down and start i have some settings on a drum dial for my bottom heads on my main snare drums i use that really have brought me to a really consistent place and i don't stress on it at all yeah and that's again why i love that tool because snare drums in that bottom head especially man you've got to get it right what do you use like style of bottom head um i use I have kind of gravitated to the really super thin. If I can find the Ludwig ones, I like those. Mm -hmm. um, Evans, their 300 is is clear and thin like that. Um, the, and I still, the Remo ones I like, I'm a Remo guy in general, but for some reason those thinner, clear heads that Evans and Ludwig have seem to bring about something I'm hearing. Um, some sensitivity maybe or something mm -hmm. and I know the collar thing factors in too yeah you know the, the the Remo one will tend to pull out and and give and stretch a little easier than the other so um, that might be part of like it lasts a little longer for me or stays consistently uh, where I want it in the Ludwig head and in the um, so that I've kind of gone that route now I used to be just a hardcore Remo guy I'm a little, uh, a little more lenient on certain bass drum batter and snare resonant yeah. heads now. So I don't know. It's you're supposed to be old and set in your ways, and I'm kind of going the opposite route. I don't, it's weird. Could that be senility? It, it could be. Um, it, it could be quite frankly that maybe I got those Evans 300 heads for. Two dollars and fifty cents cheaper than the Remo ones. I mean, who are we kidding? You know, sometimes they blow. I, I had a, a the beauty of drumform.org. Uh, every once in a while, someone will put up like five dollar Evans G1 coated. You know that kind yeah. of thing. So I'll stock up like that. Uh, our dear friend Jeff Riley mm -hmm. threw some music store blowing out their heads the other day, and I got. 10 coded ambassadors for you know $65 shipped or something stupid like that thanks for so letting I, me know I grab well you, you're just you know I, I know you and Roy and your little romance <laughs> I didn't want to get you in Roy, trouble man. my Roy Matt your Roy Matt yeah Chris Brady you know yeah leaving long heated messages on your phone for cheating on them wow they're good dudes man yeah but but um I you know I I all joking aside, I, I tend to, I'm liking this uh, clear, thin thing. Well, so. you know, and one thing about the snare drum stuff that we're going to talk about is that more so than any of these other styles of drums, tom-toms and bass drums and whatnot, 
there are probably more variables on a snare drum mm -hmm. than any and other taste. drum. And taste. Because, I mean, of course, you've got all the varieties of different shell compositions of, of the myriad of woods, especially of these boutique manufacturers. But you've also got a myriad of metals also. That, you, you know, know and man, snare we Snare beds in, versus oh, there, nut, You know what I mean? That's huge. Snare yeah. beds. Mm -hmm. can, I mean, that is something that often is overlooked. And, Absolutely. Oh, I, I, I don't like that. Bubinga snare drum. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be that it's got crappy snare beds right. on it. And it. I tend to like real gradual snare drums. It mm -hmm. brings out sensitivity and and really lets the drum be what it is. Yeah. Um, in a lot of the properties of the shell and you know even even down to the hoop selection on that Absolutely. that snare bed can can be a a huge influence on all of that so um that that's something that that you should be mindful of and try to figure out what you like what top head do you like i am i only use two two drum heads um i use either a coded ambassador mm -hmm. or a coded cs okay and the coded uh, cs is more on the dot yeah the dot underneath mm -hmm. Um, and I use that on, on, on most of my backbeat stuff. I like that head. Mm -hmm. It just gives it, it lowers the pitch slightly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really give it a focus. Like sometimes it used to, they used to kind of market it like focus. I don't think it gives it a focus as much as it, it's kind of like a zero ring, the same kind of effect in my opinion. Um, I, I really like that head a lot, especially on my deeper metal snare drums. Mm hmm black beauty i got a deep acker light um i use a 5 by 14 superphonic a lot on my steady saturday night gig and i tend to use that head on it um but like acker lights like higher tuning i like a code and ambassador any of my drums that i use for more of a straight ahead or acoustic setting Mm -hmm. pretty much go that route for for my stuff you and i are almost the same except for the for the resonant side the, the resonant side on every single drum i just use a snare side single ply clear snare side ambassador and bat although you know or, what or aquarian. A, it, it's a aquarian yeah. it'd be the aquarian classic clear snare mm -hmm. side i have used also they've got a high frequency snare side is what which is the, what would be the diplomat version okay i've used that before as well yeah i'm just nervous yeah. about those in yeah general. i understand that especially i mean if you're... i were just playing yeah low volume maybe but i i just i still want to believe that i could blow one of those out which i probably can't you absolutely can i have faith in you oh, all right make everybody on this podcast the all the listeners proud of you how right? macho he is <laughs> he blew out a diplomat it, you know for virtually every style though that i play except for one notice one notable style of tuning that i'll talk about in a second again that resonant side i mean it's it's on the point of becoming a brick wall yeah i mean of being super super tight highly tuned for the resonant side I'm like you, a lot of times I will use the reverse dot on a coated head. I always use coated heads. Always, 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 always. Yeah, me always, too. Always, always. And um, I don't like how they look otherwise. You don't like seeing the snares straight through? Them? No. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a geek in that, like, on my vintage kits, I have to have coated resonant heads just because that's really? how they came. Yeah. And I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want people peeping into my vintage drums. Maybe, maybe they're too, they're too sacred to me or something. Maybe I don't want them seeing the painted insides of the mud. It's just drums. The, the look. Yeah. And and the, the and and it does it. That it bother I, like a clear snare drum head. That's weird to me. I'm like, yeah. All of a sudden, I feel like I'm gonna be asked to play like some rudimental cadence or something, <laughs> <laughs> which which we both know yeah. would be probably the end of my career. So the, the, the top heads uh, that I would, again, choose would be the, the, the regular, like classic 
uh, not classic clear, excuse me, but the texture coated mm -hmm. or the, the single ply coated heads or the, the reverse dot single ply uh, coated heads. Tuning wise, I'm, I'm a little bit on the top head, a little bit like John with bass drum. I just try to get them fairly close for the style of music that I'm playing. I, for most of my rock and pop stuff, man, it's just a very centralized medium tuning. Yeah. Not gospel chops high and and not Don Henley long run low. Right. You know, somewhere it, in the middle of that. It, it's interesting, too. I, I probably 20 years ago tended to, you know, maybe yeah. I tend to have it a little higher. Some of that's what was popular. Some of that was coming from that period. We, all, we, we both came through that piccolo phase which was mm -hmm. everybody had that whole vibe for a while but um i i still go back to this medium tuning and and snare drum too man the feel yeah like it's just got to feel right like now at this point if that something's really tight it it i almost can't play it you know what gets on my last freaking nerve man about that that super super high tuning is a lot of times in combination with that guys it will take their snares and super super gank them up really tight i mean oh, as tight as you yeah. can get and and you know it when you're sitting behind the drum and you play it it sounds even choked but you get if you get even 10 feet in front of it it sounds just like a little bleep sounds awful man so so one thing in particular i would encourage everybody is is don't don't tighten up your snares so tight to where you just end up getting a little chirp uh, right. off your drum that i understand that that especially some younger drummers and i was guilty of this as a kid you know you're so accustomed to hearing things on a record or on a on a cd and you know you might hear this muted drum or you know at least a gated or something some kind of a drum and it sounds like there's no snare rattling anywhere when you hit a tom or the sound you know that's just not not the case mm -hmm. you know when you're right on top of a snare drum it's way more obvious that your snares might be rattling when you hit a tom tom or even when you hit the snare drum itself but that actually helps fill out your sound mm -hmm. i would just say be really careful about over tensioning your snares themselves and which leads me to the the other way that i was talking about that i will tune especially for a rock or pop thing if i want to go for we'll say that don henley the long run sound that is a case where i will not tune the resonant head super tight mm. it won't be it'll still be tight but it won't be crazy tight i have somewhat of an affinity for those 40 strand snares okay I'll put on on a drum like that, especially to say, let's say, we'll say a like a six and a half, uh, uh, Black Beauty style drum. Put a forty strand snare on there, leave those suckers hanging, man. I mean, hanging down there on the bottom, and then tune the snare drum, batter head, down low, coated reverse dot, and then mute the crap out of it. And yep. then if it's a recording, then plate reverb all the way man to, right. to give it some resonance you know there's some there's some things about especially low tuning that are overlooked um you use the don henley but th that era uh, there was a, a lot of that low tune thing but you know s what we forget is that sound was as much the recording process as mm -hmm. it was the tuning in that you had the snare drum tuned down and loose and all that but you also i mean you're just in the red with levels because you were recording the tape and you could do that and that's like guitar sounds as well like certain records from the 70s sound the way they do because they're able to saturate levels in recording because they're going to tape it's not digital it's not you know so there's there's certain things that factor into um that you know if it's driving you crazy maybe you're recording at home or whatever and why can't i get that to do well there's certain things that you might not be aware of like and that's one of them um but as far as i, I really the snare drum in particular 
I didn't get it together until I started recording a lot more. Like mm -hmm. I think I cringe to think about my sound. I think it was always okay, you know, but that real fine tuned understanding the nature of a drum in context of a kit in context of mics in context of a stage full of other instruments, you know, you really get a better handle on that when you're not sitting behind the kit. And recording is what, you know, I'm not a front of house guy and I don't pay much attention. I'm never in front of a band. You know, I go see a band on occasion, but you know, something else is annoying me. So I'm not focused on the snare drum, but recording really brought it. And especially when I started teching and an engineer or a producer was like, man, I'm going for this vibe. You got to figure it out. And I started paying more attention to it and subtle things like the tension of the snares. Mm -hmm. Yep how it made a break it can make a break the whole vibe of the drum you know play around with that stuff but be aware of context is so important in tuning man and you know what that made me think i just wrote something down right when you were talking about the context of this and a subtle thing you know something else that i do is when i've gotten my drums 90 percent in tune when they're on the kit and or when they're all set up as a kit, I always put my cymbals up and then finish the rest of the tuning. Because when you've got the full kit with the cymbals present, it does change things. Mm -hmm. And so I always make sure, that was one thing I wanted to say, is that I always make sure the cymbals are on the kit when they get the final tuning before the session or the gig. That's great, man. You know, that kind of that kind of touches on samples too and how sampling has obviously they've become a fine art but early on you know they were doing things where they're isolating a drum and sampling it and it always like the old drum machine samples and i'm kind of like uh, yeah and you know the, the 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 best engineers and the best um audio geeks realized Man, when you're hitting that snare drum, you want all those mics from that kid open, mm -hmm. that room being heard, the snares, you know, like all that, because that's truly how you're going to be applying it. Yep. Like if you're adding yep. a snare sample, well, you're applying it to a kit. Essentially, it's being played, even if it's samples, it's still an entire kit working as one entity so to not sample that in mind or again not tune with that in mind right really is problematic and you have to think past that and think in context what is it and you know and we we while we're sitting there tuning a drum we're so locked into it that we're losing sight of that and and it's easy to do I, i'm guilty of it to this day but it's like wait man you know, sitting next to three toms or five cymbals, right, is going to change the dynamic of this drum. You know, you you have to remember that, and so maybe maybe it's best that once you get things kind of in tune with itself, is to sit down and 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 really make sure it's working as a, a unit. Exactly, it's really hard. It's hard to 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 keep sight of that sometimes when you're. I got to get this drum locked in, you know. Right. Well, it might be right, maybe not. So to kind of finish up our little segment on, on tuning, John, at the earliest part of the show, gave you an absolute pearl of wisdom regarding double ply heads. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put my pearl of wisdom now. All right, man. Let me tell you something that I always carry with me in like my stick bag. or Right now it's in my stick bag and like the pocket on the front. I always keep a piece of 220 sandpaper in there because especially if you're going to play brushes, when you put a brand new coated head on, it's a little bit thick, the coating is. Misery. Yeah. And sometimes there's also a few little imperfections. You know, they might have a little bit of coating that kind of stands up and catches a brush, yep. catches a strand. 
and uh, I sand it off a little bit and get it a little thinner and mm -hmm. a, just a tad bit smoother so it doesn't catch my brushes. It allows them to move freely. How's that for Pearl of Wisdom? Huh? I love that. I'm so glad you said that because I have in, you know, I put a new snare drum head on and not thinking about that and get to a gig and there's like, oh, we're doing an hour of low key stuff. And I mean, you don't, you just have to block out the misery that is a brand new coated head when you're yeah. playing brushes. Cause whether you're an accomplished brush player or not, it is a hindrance, I think. It, and you're proving my point in that you mm -hmm. are well versed in brushes and it annoys you versus me. I'm, I'm an average brush player that has a few patterns, but it's just like, I don't need to be distracted more. Man, you, so get, it's like, oh. you get stuck in the mud, literally. Man. Yeah, it's you know? crazy. Yeah, when you do that. I'm glad to hear that. So That's awesome. Well, anyway, folks, that that's our take on on tuning. And, and by, by no means is it the be-all, end-all, but it does give you some insight on how we approach it, having, been, having done it for years and years and years and years. And we talk a little bit about, you know, the different, of course, styles of music that we have to play and how that affects our tunings and also the different kits. So... You know, I know everyone's going to want to, you know, have their own take on it. So chime in, you know, let us know, you know, if you have something, you know, that you want to add to it or whatever. We're we're listening. That's for sure. Yeah, man, I'm I'm open to anybody's idea on tuning. Like I said, um, I, I, I'm not terribly excited about tuning ever because it's, yeah. it's difficult. Man, I don't you know, I know guys that are. 60 70 years old have been doing it forever and they'll tell you the same thing tuning's a bitch yeah it is man it's it's an imperfect science on an imperfect instrument and you know the you, you just it's trial and error and you get lucky sometimes and but try to find a an approach you can you know at least get you to a reasonable place and you can start fine tuning if you can't tell by that we're asking for help help come and tune my drum so i don't have to there you go so we we mentioned earlier also that we're going to address uh some listener questions yeah, today and boy i'll tell you this one is this one is short and sweet from the i mean straight to the talk about cut to the bone straight to the point this one comes from one of our drum forum listeners Patrick that we've talked about before he he had a very very succinct question and we're going to try to address it the best we can and he he asks us do you ever get nervous and then what do you do to counteract that and I'll give you my two little bits of, of info and then we'll let let John go forward with it and my two small bits is this one be as prepared as you possibly can Amen. I mean, and we're talking, you know, we've done a couple of, of podcasts, one on gig preparation, and that's the first part of being prepared, is be prepared for the gig. And that means learn the music, anything that these that a band leader can give you to say, hey, we have to, to do this stuff, learn it. Learn that stuff as best as you can. Make charts if you have to. And then we also did a thing on personal responsibility and that that is a little bit on preparation and also but it has to do more with like personal things like make sure you have your gear ready make sure you're using the right tools for the right gig make sure you're going to be on time make sure you know your route make sure your car your transportation however make sure that it is trustworthy and ready to go so preparation 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 right and then the second part of this is that nervousness shall we say is a type of anxiety and that type of anxiety or I should say any anxiety really is regarding something in the future something that hasn't happened and as our listeners that have heard all these shows know we like to wax psychological on here we're, we're the, we play we play ham-fisted shade tree psychiatrist on here and and the 
I guess the quick and dirty definition of two of the, the, the great mental maladies of our time is depression is a, a worry over something that has happened in the past and anxiety is a worry over something that hasn't happened yet. So we're gonna call nervousness an anxiety style disorder and it's worry over, again, things that haven't happened on the gig yet, right? Mm -hmm. So my cure-all being the king of anxiety and the only thing that I have ever found that works on this and that works consistently is you have to walk toward the anxiety and just take it on and do it. The more you avoid, the worse it, it gets and the anxiety feeds upon itself, so to speak. Or the, and, we're, and, and in anxiety here, we're calling that nervousness, right? So these anxieties or nervousness you might have toward anything that you can't control in the future you have to move toward it and attack it because if you don't move forward on it again it will feed upon itself and it will continue it'll be the vicious cycle of getting worse and worse and worse if you avoid it so that's my take on it is prepare yourself for every possible thing that you can right that you have control over and then the things that you don't have control over that make you nervous you just have to move forward and attack it and do it and then hopefully your nervousness will start to subside for future events so there's my take good stuff um mine is a little uh, i think when i think about gigs that i get nervous about it's typically one of two things um, it can be where there's a certain band or certain players or it's a gig that a certain drummer is doing that I'm filling in for and you know there's legendary status or they're you know everybody's raving about this and that and I can get pretty worked up about that you know like oh. I, I if I had a dollar for every musician I know that is not unlike me in that you have this never ending, I'm going to be found out crap that goes along in your brain. I, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I am so out of control with that. Like, you know, what, what is the worst case scenario for me? I'm going to get called to do a session. It's going to be some burning Latin thing in odd time that you have to read down once. That's never going to happen, you know? So like, what am I, why am I creating this? I'm going to get found out. I never take any gigs that I don't belong on. So that in itself is just neurosis that is doing nothing but, you know, causing me pain. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to be, it's not realistic. Um, and, and the other part, you know, being prepared, I'm, again, I prepare largely based on my insecurity like man i want to i want to be as comfortable as i can because you know look like on my gig that i do i'm pretty unintimidated i'm like yeah there's better drummers i hire the best drummers i can find because i'm like man it's a big old fat groove gig i got a pretty good handle on that i'm, I'm not worried about it but you know going into these I did a gig the other night, you know, the band's legendary for this. We'll play whatever you request. Mm -hmm. And that's just not my skill set, man. And it just freaks me out. And I just like the whole day, I'm like a nervous wreck, you know? I mean, a couple songs just kind of aren't great, but in general, the gig's fine. Everybody's happy. Nobody gets hurt. It's all good. You know a lot. You remember a lot more than you think you do. But um, I, I think that the nervousness comes more from uh, from ability for me than anything. Like I don't, you know, my technique's not together, or I'm not real well versed in this. And that you know, I counter it with I just don't take gigs that I shouldn't be on. So that's helped me lessen my nervousness. The other part of it, playing with musicians, you know, like you hold in high regard, whatever, man, they're going to have their opinion of you no matter what. 
go in and do what you do. Do the best job you can do. Be musical. Be professional. Be chill. Be aware of your surroundings. Do the best job you can do. And if someone's going to, if someone doesn't dig your plan, they don't dig your plan. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. It is what it is. So that's my battle and somewhat of a solution, I guess. Sure. Well, you know, there, there's a, uh, a pretty valid concept out there that basically says that the human mind from over all the years and years and years of development and evolution still has the bias toward to hang toward hanging on to negative thoughts as a defense mechanism mm -hmm. as opposed to emboldening and and really hanging on to the positive stuff and i think it all comes back to just being of surviving you know and and of course in today's society we don't necessarily have to worry about being eaten by a uh, t-rex or a you know or a saber-toothed tiger our stuff now is worried about getting attacked on twitter yeah you know and so you know and so it's the kind of thing that we're where th these different mental maladies so to speak are brought on by an entirely separate and non-threatening set of circumstances but yet our our poor little brains interpret them as oh my gosh just crippling yeah, yeah. that 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 this you know a grizzly bear is going to jump out it, it treats it the same way so unfortunately like i said there, there's there's real aside from you know just trying to prepare you know the 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 hard fact of the whole thing is you just have to move toward it it's just like john said i mean you know there, there are there are times that you're going to be dealing with some people that no matter how you play they're going to have a preconceived notion or have a certain feeling about the way that you play that may not change and that's okay but you move forward move forward you do the gig and you come out and everything's going to be fine yep. i will guarantee you you'll feel better about yourself than is than if you cowered back and and you know and and tried to shy away from it so mm -hmm. to speak go forward move forward is my and, and learn from scenarios like the other night i played a gig where you know all the standard dance crap i knew but the first set i thought was a little rough and i i, I could have said, asked you know i could have been proactive and said hey man what's going to happen you know are we doing any kind of low-key stuff what do you do because everybody approaches that a little different and you know instead of me just flipping out like i would have years ago like oh everybody hated my playing because of two songs that weren't great you know i'm like hey you know what next time i'm gonna make sure i have a good handle on what is expected me outside of the obvious perfect and 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 that will eliminate some anxiety for me yep going into another gig similar to that we're going to finish up today with one of our favorite segments we're going to each have a take on a great overlooked slash underappreciated drummer and so john why don't you go first I, kn I know what you're going to i know what your pick is before this i'm going to go ahead and, and say man this is your show today you you picked a man super winner yeah go right ahead um, uh, my, my guy today is the legendary LA session drummer. And, uh, I say legendary because when I say his name and you think about it, you, you're like, yeah, you're right. And that's Carlos Vega, who is just insanely great on every level and kind of was a victim of other insanely great players that were just smack dab in the middle of the Los Angeles recording scene when he was. You know, your Picaros and your John Robinsons and your Harvey Masons. And I mean, the, the list is endless. Mm -hmm. um, but Carlos was doing every bit as brilliant playing and grooving and stretching as anybody a broad set of live gigs did a lot of records like you know uh, that really were high level grp 
mm-hmm. uh, was one that that Dave Guzan stuff. He did a lot of that stuff, um, and you know, quite frankly, he could have pretty much just done one record that I know you'll agree with me on, and cemented his status in my mind in it, and that's the live James Taylor record from the mid '80s, mid to late '80s. I mean, just beyond amazing and musical and just just undeniable there are so many good things on that record that you you could you could just spend the whole whole time talking about that record i mean aside from great groove playing there's some oh so many little subtle things he does that that i was telling you before we recorded this that i've ripped off of his that i play on some of the every time i have to cover a james taylor tune Mm -hmm. i i throw back to that live record and cop some of Carlos Vegas stuff that he does. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I actually defer to that even instead of the original stuff because it's just so great. And he kind of ties together a a modern approach. And like, you know, like Fire and Rain, you know, mm-hmm. that, that was brushes, you know, like with mics cranked up and yeah. Russ Kunkel doing his thing. And it sounds fat and huge. Well, you're not going to, that's not going to, translate live so there's some you know he he brought some of that into a a, and framed it in a live setting really well did some of his own thing but um you know still true to the spirit of the song and hippened up a few things yeah modernized a few things there's also there's some other i mean you can dig into his discography like the other people we've mentioned and and find a lot of incredible stuff um, one record I mentioned to Phil, uh, Matt Rawlings, the uh, Nashville session pianist, keyboard player, who's just an unbelievable musician in his own right. He did a trio record that was instrumental that Carlos was on uh, that uh, I think it's called Balconies. Mm-hmm. And and a lot more stretching, a lot, a lot more of Latin kind of stuff and that that. Carlos had a great handle on, yeah. and his sound too, man. His sound, like like every other LA session legend that from that period, their sound so together. That snare drum sound on that uh, live James Taylor Incredible. thing. It's a live record. It sounds like a million bucks. Yep. I mean, really, that sound great. Interestingly enough, you know who engineered that record? Nope. Russ's son, Nathaniel. So about Conkle, Russ Conkle. Yeah who is an incredible engineer he did he he recorded that whole live it was a series of shows i think and they yeah. pulled from uh yeah his son i believe is wow what was that so keeping it the family huh talented yeah. family nonetheless but carlos vega man oh oh incredible call. some great stuff man like live charisma stuff and all that too that he plays on incredible call thank yeah. you thank My, you carlos yeah my guy uh, that I'm going to talk about today, who, for the people that know me personally, know that this is not a stretch. You know, they know that this is one of my favorite musicians, favorite favorite players. But he is sorely underrecognized, in my opinion. Is the great Kenny Washington? Swing it. Yeah. Oh my God. Woo. Yeah. There's probably nobody that swings any harder than Kenny Washington. Kenny Washington is a New York-based jazz drummer. And he is a traditionalist in the name of traditionalist. And as they say in the dictionary, beside the word traditionalist, there is a picture of Kenny Washington, otherwise known as the jazz maniac. He used, John, he used to have a he used to have a show on uh, the radio up in I think it was in it was in New York or New Jersey where the station was. He did it, man, for like fifteen or sixteen years, where he did a he hosted a show that. Uh, he just played great historic jazz records and and he's well known throughout the jazz community as probably being the foremost jazz historian this guy not to sound sacrilegious to all the the jazz purists he probably knows as much or more than even the guys that were that are still alive that took part in making that history i mean this guy is he is scary from the standpoint of just his knowledge of jazz history and he has arguably 
the greatest collection of music, jazz music, I should say, on the face of the planet. I love that. Yeah, it, it's absolutely amazing. So now that we've kind of talked about him in generalities, talk about his, his drumming a little bit, he really, again, comes from the true, to the true tradition of hard swinging, hard bop, bebop jazz. Um, unapologetic. Unapologetic. He, his mentors were Papa Joe Jones. So that'll tell you something right there. And Mel Lewis. Mm -hmm. Those are two of his great mentors. Also Philly Joe Jones. But uh, he has sort of taken the reins and he is now sort of the Papa Joe Jones. He is, he'll call you a knucklehead man in a, in a minute. Yeah, he'll call you a knucklehead in a minute. But his body of work absolutely speaks for itself. This guy has been on probably, and I'm going to be conservative when I say 300 recordings or so. And some of the ones that I really like, I made a little list of like half a dozen that I think it's worth checking out. Some of them start as early as like the mid 80s and go all the way up until like 2000 or so. One of my favorite ones he played on, and, and I'll try to put some videos up on our YouTube channel for this because I'm gonna say that more than, if not all of them, at least four of these are probably out of print. There's an album from the mid 80s by Ralph Moore called Images, absolute brilliant. Uh, he also did a piano trio album with Mulgrew Miller in the late 80s called From Day to Day. Brilliant. One of the foremost piano trio albums in history was one that Tommy Flanagan did called Jazz Poet. Uh, there is a cut on there called Mean Streets, and I think that's what, what Tommy Flanagan used to actually call Kenny. Well, he used to use his nickname was Mean Streets. <laughs> he is a brush god on that track. Uh, okay. I mean, it's it doesn't get any higher level than that. Uh, he also played with Bill Charlap, or still does play with Bill Charlap from time to time. There's a great record from the early 2000s, I believe it was when it was recorded. It's called Written in the Stars. Uh, there was a, a very little known record from the late 80s called Self Portrait in Swing by a jazz guitarist named Joshua Breakstone. Uh, there's a little arrangement of Some Enchanted Evening on there that Kenny Washington's out of his mind on. And then, last one I'll mention is there was a record uh, by Marcus Printup and Tim uh, Hagen's two trumpet players that did a, a tribute album to, to Freddie Hubbard, some of his recordings called Hub Songs. Kenny Washington's absolutely brilliant on there. Awesome. And then just the last few things I'll say about Kenny is that uh, he is probably the, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw it out there, the greatest living jazz piano trio drummer. And if you just look at the piano trios that he's been a part of, oh my gosh, he's played with Benny Green's trio, Mulgrew Miller's trio, Bill Charlap, Tommy Flanagan. Um, and I believe he is pretty much the steady drummer for Ahmad Jamal now since um, uh, Idris Muhammad uh, passed away. Yep. I mean, he is just a brilliant, sensitive, uh, historically accurate uh, piano trio drummer. And, uh, and then John, not to, to extend this anymore, but I've got I gotta throw my little quick story about him in there and, and his legendary 22-inch uh, Istanbul K that, that was on all those recordings from like the, the 80s, late 70s and 80s, all the way up until probably just a few years ago. I actually was the curator of that symbol for about two weeks or so. I actually, he let me he let me have it for a few weeks simply from the standpoint of back when when that Bosphorus symbol company was was up and rolling here in the Atlanta area. Um, he let me hang on to that symbol for uh, a little while until I could get it up to those guys mm -hmm. and try to get them to copy it, which unsuccessfully it it, it just didn't happen. But uh, that symbol is absolute magic. And, and just a little bit of history behind that symbol that some of our listeners will find kind of interesting. That symbol was given to him by Mel Lewis. Mm. Yeah, one of his mentors. And uh, if anybody knows the history of the, the old Ks, 
those old K's used to come in pairs when they were shipped from, from Turkey. I didn't know that. Yeah, they came in pairs. And Mel Lewis had a pair. He gave one symbol to Kenny Washington, and the other one went to Jeff Hamilton. Wow. Yeah, so they had sister symbols, you know. And, uh, yeah, I got to hang on to that symbol for a little while. And, and then that symbol for our uh, symbol junkie listeners, that symbol is the prototype for the new K Zildjian bounce ride. Mm. How did they do with it? Really good, man. Hmm. If you've heard any of them, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty good. Now, let me say that being said, that symbol by itself, when I had it, and that was like 15 years ago, it had an enormous crack around the bell mm -hmm. to where, I mean, it was, it, it hung weird from a stand, you know? Right. So, they did the best they can to try to copy a broken symbol. Right. That's what it was. So anyway, that's educated that's my, guess. Yeah, by educated way of guess. The but the bounce result. I've played a couple of those bounce rides and they sound pretty good to my ears. I'll tell you that. So that's that's my call. Guys, listen to Kenny Washington, just an absolute monster beast jazz drummer, his unapologetic bebop drummer. Just he every time he sits down he brings about 10 legends to the bandstand with him i know i will that's yeah. exciting man thanks for sharing we gave these guys more for their money today man this is a long one. Oh, i hope everybody is okay with that yeah free rambling free rambling that's right well that's all i got man i can't talk anymore my mouth's parched i'm hurting too yeah that is a rare occurrence all right, guys, stay in touch with us. Please give us email, send us emails at our uh, Gmail account. Stay in touch with us out on our Facebook and our Twitter account. And please go download us, stream us, rate us on iTunes. We love it. We can take it. Until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.